Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for being with us at Kennedy School. My name is Nick Burns. I'm a professor here at the Kennedy School. I also chair the school's Middle East Initiative, and it's a great honor for us to welcome to Harvard and the Kennedy School Dr. Aina Vilf, who is a member of the Knesset and the Labor Party. More about Dr. Vilf in just a minute, but I wanted to just say that this is a, uh, one of the series of events that we're having this autumn to focus our students and our faculty and staff and interests in others. On the Middle East, we have a number of other um, speakers this month and next month. And um, I'm sure, Hillary, you can, we can point people to our website. Uh, if people are interested afterwards, Hillary Rantisi is the executive director of our program. We'll be happy to talk to you about that schedule of speakers. I want to recognize a very good friend, Professor Shai Feldman of Brandeis University, who is with us today. And we're starting a Harvard, Brandeis, Brandeis, Harvard, Middle East seminar in a week's time that will bring both universities together, focus on the Middle East, and Professor Feldman and I will be co-chairing that seminar. Dr. Anand Vilf um, has just arrived in Boston from Washington, D.C. As I said, she's a member of the Israeli Knesset. She's a member of the Labor Party. She serves on the Foreign Affairs, Defense, Education, and House Committees of the Knesset. She is the author of two books. She's a former advisor to the Israeli president, President Shimon Peres. She also is a graduate of this university. She is a government and fine arts major. She is incredibly well ed educated and also has advanced degrees from INSEAD. And so um, it's a great pleasure to have her with us today. I've asked uh, Dr. Bill to speak about Israeli politics and about the Israeli-Palestinian negotiations. The title of her talk is Left, Right, or Center, Israel's Political Map, but she's also going to give us her analysis of what's happening now and whether or not Israelis, and this Israeli, this Israeli, uh, are indeed optimistic or pessimistic about the current round of peace negotiations between the Palestinian Authority and the State of Israel. Dr. Bill, it's a pleasure to welcome you back to Harvard. Thank you very much for being with us. Can you all hear me? Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador Burns, for a very kind introduction. Thank you, Professor Feldman, for hosting me. I'd like also to recognize a dear colleague, Ophir uh, Pinus Paz, who's now with the Kennedy School, and thanks to whom I'm a member of Knesset, and I hope you're enjoying your time. <laughs> um, so I'll open uh, and discuss a little bit the Israeli political map and the upcoming negotiations and then open it as soon as possible to questions so we can have much of a discussion. I'd actually like to start from uh, a point or from a somewhat controversial headline, an article that appeared recently in Time magazine, which essentially argued that Israelis are no longer interested in peace and no longer want peace. And obviously, uh, this article generated a lot of controversy. Uh, at one point, I noticed, even though they have just the abridged version on the website, uh, after 522 comments, they wrote a big sign, kind of, we're no longer accepting comments on this article. So obviously, there was quite a discussion there. And uh, putting aside uh, kind of various aspects of the article, it did touch on a very, very important one. And I think the best way to understand it, it says something about the kind of the last 20 years and the emotional roller coaster that Israelis have gone through in the last 20 years. And I think the best way to understand this emotional emotional roller coaster and its impact on Israel's political map is to take two key points. The one is the first intifada, the one that started at the end of 87 and pretty much ended with the beginning of the Madrid negotiations, and the second intifada, which erupted after the failure of the Camp David peace negotiations. The first intifada uh, was also the one, the first one that my generation was conscripted into. It was certainly a popular uprising. These were the images. Uh, children with uh, slip stones, uh, women carrying flags, uh, a real uprising of a people who wished for 
for their dignity and for their state. After trying to subdue that intifada and failing, many Israelis, certainly many of my generation, but many in general, having also had to face a very complex reality, not the black and white reality of the heroic wars that we read about in our books, came to the conclusion that there's no military solution to our conflict with the Palestinians. So by the end of the 80s, the beginning of the 90s, a big chunk of the Israeli population, certainly Labor Party voters, certainly those on the left, are saying to themselves, there's no military solution to our conflict with the Palestinians. Ergo, we need to look for diplomatic solutions, for negotiated solutions. And this is pretty much what opens the 90s. The Madrid Peace Conference, later the Oslo Accords, and ultimately it all comes to a pinnacle to a head at the Camp David peace negotiations in 2000. So throughout the 90s, certainly the left political map in Israel, but also much in the center, tries to pursue a negotiated solution to the conflict with the Palestinian, pushed by a sense of failure of military solutions. The Camp David Peace Summit in 2005. Dozens of books have been written about why it failed. I'm sure many of the writers were here at the Kennedy School as well. Everyone tells their own perspective, their own story. It's very hard to actually pin down. But it failed. And not only did it fail, it failed spectacularly. And it descended into this bloodbath, which was called the Second Intifada. And the Second Intifada had absolutely nothing with its first namesake. None of those images of a popular uprising of a people in search of dignity. This was a bloodbath. Suicide bombings in Israel's main cities, certainly not limited to the West Bank and Gaza, much more of an organized military guerrilla suicide campaign, and one that jolted a lot of Israelis. I can tell you that I myself, living in Israel through that period, which was a harrowing, difficult period, I, find my, I found myself questioning a lot of my basic premises. I grew up in your classic labor Zionist household, certain that the day that the Palestinians will get their state in the West Bank and Gaza is the day we will have peace. That this is what the conflict is all about, and this is what will end the conflict. And having experienced the Second Intifada, I remember finding that I kind of wanted to take the this Palestinian person and just shake him up and say, what is it that you want? Tell me what you want, because if it is a state that you want for your people, you could have had one ten times over. Numerous times. But if more than you want a state for yourself, you want the Jewish people not to have their own state, then there's actually nothing but war between us. There's nothing we can negotiate. It's not something that is up for discussions in beautiful rooms across Europe.